Hello, I'm Rowan Leach, the Regional Ag Landcare Facilitator for the Central West and part of a team consisting of local land services and regional land care facilitators, Liz Davis, Mel Keel and Sharon Cuniel. Welcome to our second session of Future Proof Your Business with Paul Ryan. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we all meet today, in particular the Wiradjuri people, where I am calling from. I would also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Before we begin, uh, just run through some housekeeping. All sessions will be recorded and available online within 24 hours of each session. Again, can I please ask you to keep your camera off and your microphone muted. If you would like to change your view of the presenters, a button in the top right corner called gallery or speaker view will let you change who you are looking at. Any questions, please wait till the end and raise your hand using the icon on the toolbar or write your questions into the chat function and we will read them out at the conclusion of the webinar. Towards the end, we'll put up a survey link in the chat section. Please take a few minutes to provide your feedback on the session and be in the chance to win a book. We had a wonderful response to last week's survey and the winner randomly selected to receive Growing a Revolution by David Montgomery. The winner was Claudia Wise from Mudgee. So to be in, with, in the running for the next book, be sure to fill out the survey. I'm thrilled to invite our presenter for the series, Paul Ryan from the Australian Resilience Centre to begin session two. Thanks Rowan. Um, and for those of you joining uh, for the first time to these sessions, welcome. Uh, my name's Paul Ryan, I'm from the Australian Resilience Centre. Uh, and for people coming back from the first session, uh, um, welcome back and thanks for joining us for this second session. What we're going to do today is to talk about um, a little bit about some of the foundational things that we covered in the first session. So we'll recap a couple of those things and then we're going to talk primarily about uh, ways to diagnose resilience problems. And we've got a couple of little tools that we use all the time in our work to help us to actually diagnose, to understand the problems that we're trying to work on and to make sure we're working at the right levels. So that's what we're going to do. I'll just share my screen and we'll go through uh, just a couple of um, key ideas that we, we covered last week. So the first thing is this idea of the farm business as a system. So obviously it's not just about dollars and it's not just about, um, you know, getting products off the farm. We know that farming is a social business. It's about mostly about you and your family and, and the other people that are involved in your farm business, the people that work with you and for you and all of, all of the people connected um, directly to that farm business. But it also takes place in a place. Farming is, is a place-based activity. So that brings with it a whole range of things. And so this idea of the farm as a, a system of people and place, and of course you're connected to a community. So you're part of a bigger place, you're connected to the markets and um, you're connected to the bigger ecosystems that the farm is part of. This idea that, that farming and a farm is a, is a system, is a, is a core idea of trying to think about its resilience and thinking about all of those connections and, and the linkages between parts of the system because that's often where um, resilience needs to be strengthened or um, where there's sort of impacts of some of the things that impact on us and, and create stress on us. So that's a really one of the important ideas that we covered last week. The second one is that resilience is about not just bouncing back and for most people, I think you're aware of this idea, but it's really important to reinforce that resilience is not just about having a shock absorber. It's, it's, it, that's really important. We need to have that ability to absorb and to bounce back, but we also need to bounce forward. We need to create these opportunities to bounce forward. So that's the idea of the, the springboard. And so if we take those ideas together, and we can think then of a definition of resilience that's something like this, that resilience is the capacity of a system to cope with change and create opportunities towards a positive future. So we're taking that systems idea, we're saying cope, which is about bouncing back and having that ability to absorb like a shock absorber and uh, the ability to bounce forward to create opportunities for a different future and a positive future. So they're really key ideas and we're going, to, we're going to build on those as we go through this, uh, but we're going to talk particularly about some diagnostics that can help us to understand that. 
We also talked about this idea of stress and this stress curve. This is just a generic stress curve. Um, and this could be about you mentally, it could be about you physically, it could be about your business, it could be about um, the, the, the family, it could be about your ecosystem. Uh, so this is just a kind of generic idea to help us to think about it. And I guess one of the messages I want to convey is this, how stress, wherever it is in the system, um, ultimately will come back to us and kind of uh, have impacts on us. And whether that's a degraded ecosystem, you know, a, a, a long drought, a fire, um, or that low level stress from, from um, just being overworked or being uh, under pressure, all of those things, or you know, financial stress, whatever it might be, all of those things ultimately sort of come back and get processed by us in our brain and this um, propensity, if you like, for us to, to, um, to focus on these particular stressful things and that triggers off a whole process in the body that really is very um, unhealthy for us for it to be sustained for too long. And I talked about this last week that really we're, we're okay with short-term stress, long-term stress is very bad for us uh, mentally, physically leads to poor decision making, it creates lots of tension in relationships uh, and ultimately it's not where we want to be. And if we're in that high stress state for a long period of time, it will impact on us um, mentally and physically. So what we really want to do, you know, as, as people, we can operate reasonably well with a bit of stress down here, but as that stress rises, it starts to create problems. And as we get to the top, obviously, we're in that kind of red zone and we really want to avoid being in that red zone. So resilience building, can help us to uh, lower that stress, keep us out of that red zone uh, and help to sort of flatten the curve, if you like. And there's some things that we can do before, uh, during and after a stressful, um, or, or the, when there's a stress on the system, there's things we can do before, during and after that can really help us to lower that stress. So that's the sort of core idea that we're trying, foundational idea that we're trying to bring in here as well. So that's, that's where we were last week last session. What I want to do now is focus on a couple of tools that can help us to sort of diagnose resilience problems in the work that we're doing in our farm business or working with community or as part of communities. We use these tools all the time. The first one is this idea of an iceberg and you know we're all familiar with the kind of tip of the iceberg idea that what you see above the water is really only a small part of the iceberg. It's similar with thinking about resilience. And in particular, we might think of an event like a, um, an extreme event like a, a flood or a drought or a bushfire um, or, you know, a, a big policy decision or a big financial disaster or something like that. That's the event. And this is what we can sort of see. It kind of attracts our attention, if you like. And it's really easy to get focused and anchored on those events. These events are typically faster, things that happen quickly. Um, but they're usually about just parts of the system. They're not happening to the whole system at once, usually. Uh, they're, they're usually just symptoms. These events are symptoms of a deeper underlying uh, sort of dynamic, and that's what we'll get to in a minute. And what it does is it puts us in a very reactive mode. We're spending time really caught chasing our tail and being very reactive. And that's where the stress is high. When we're caught uh, in that sort of reactive sort of mode, uh, we're going to be in a high stress state whether that's personally, whether it's financial, whether it's, you know, as a family or a community, we're going to be in a, a high stress kind of uh, dynamic. One of the key ideas here is about being able to step back and look at that event in some sort of broader picture, some bigger picture and, and asking questions about, is the event part of a pattern or what is the pattern of events? And that can really help us to think about how you know, what's the pattern here that is creating these events? And is that pattern changing? Is it changing in ways that we need to adjust to? Is it changing um, in ways that we might need to do something very different? So being aware of events, obviously we have to deal with those things as we can't avoid them. We have to deal and respond to those things, but actually stepping back and seeing them as part of a broader pattern and that can help us then to sort of understand how we respond to those events, but also help us to understand how can we intervene to start to make change. So becoming aware of the patterns of things that are happening. Sitting under that, of course, 
of course, are structures. You know, these are the things that give rise to the patterns. And so this is about how things are organised in the world. It's about how, um, you know, the rules that we make, um, how we allocate resources, how land and property rights are allocated, all those sorts of things. And so how, that, how our system is structured, whether that's a farm business, whether it's a community, whether it's the landscape, that will create certain types of patterns uh, and that'll lead to certain types of events. So understanding um, how our, our system's structured, how it's organised, and therefore how that um, gives rise to particular patterns, how it makes it vulnerable to particular types of patterns and, event, and then makes it vulnerable to particular types of events is really can bring a lot of insight. And finally, sitting under all of this is our beliefs about how we think the world works and how it should be organised. Um, and this includes, you know, our sort of understanding of things, big picture things like democracy and um, ideas like fairness and, um, you know, good governance and all those sorts of things. But it also um, it has implications for things about our belief in science, um, our belief in how we should organise and make decisions about um, critical issues. And that could be, again, at the farm or it might be for the whole uh, catchment or for a community or whatever it might be. So our beliefs are really um, fundamental in shaping how we design and set up structures. Obviously, all these things down here are harder to see. They're kind of they're things that we kind of think about how we think about the world. So, um, and these things tend to be slower. So they're changing in slower kind of rates. And so they're often harder for us to see and to understand. These things are about the bigger picture, seeing the whole. They're often about causes and, and these slow changes that sort of grind the system in a particular direction. And then it's events that sort of push us over. And so, but really working down here is where we can start to be proactive, where we can start to make changes uh, that drive a different um, set of beliefs, or maybe we can, from our beliefs, we can change the structures, you know, the way our farm business is organised or the way, um, you know, uh, um, the properties organised, physically structured, all of those sorts of things, or, um, you know, how we, we set up to deal with some of the patterns that we're starting to see. And so what are those structures, structural changes that we need to see? So, for example, we've been, you know, working with people in the wine industry. They very much uh, are changing their beliefs about climate and the, the way climate is going to influence their um, future in terms of wine production, um, obviously, and in, in changing to meet market needs. They're changing business structures, but they're also changing physical structures about how they lay out the um, the, the um, vineyards, the way they lay out vines, etc. And they're also changing structure at a big scale too, where they're now, you know, a lot of companies are starting to invest in a diversity of, of um, climate uh, um, positions, if you like, around uh, around the country uh, to to reduce their exposure to climate events. So they've recognised, you know, the patterns are changing. Uh, they recognise that they need different structures in terms of uh, the way they organise their business in re in relation to some of those sort of changes in patterns. So using this tool can help us to sort of think about what's the right level that we need to work at. Are we caught up here at the top just responding uh, and how do we get down to the sort of proactive level where we're kind of thinking about these deeper, slower changes about dealing with causes and being much more proactive. So we can ask a bunch of questions and I'll send these questions out to people um, as a part of a little pro forma about this, but we can sort of ask key questions about what happened in relation to that event, how well did we cope, um, how well did we recover, how likely is it to happen again, uh, what needs to change to avoid it happening again, those sorts of questions. And we can sort of analyse, if you like, and review what happened with a particular event. But, and that's important and really useful, um, but it's really when we start to move down here and start talking about what's actually happening, let's pull back, get this bigger picture view. What's happening here? What's the pattern? Is this a repeated thing? Are we ending up in the same situation as a business or as an individual again and again? And am I sort of, you know, recreating the same sort of pattern of behaviour and response to things um, and understanding what stresses, you know, have high impacts or poor recovery. So, you know, how well do we recover from drought versus how well do we recover from, say, you know, a big market price shift or something like that? And is there a pattern, uh, is the pattern of those stresses changing? So are they 
becoming more frequent, those events, or are they becoming more severe? Are they be getting more spaced out or whatever? And so it's pulling back and trying to see that bigger picture. And then thinking about structures, we can just ask, what are the important structures here that shape the patterns? Is it because our property size is, is too small or sub-economic? Um, is it because of where we're situated in a, in a catchment in terms of you know, exposure to flood risk? Or is it because we're, um, you know, the way our business is structured or organised? So what are those structures that actually are influencing the patterns that mean you know, we're susceptible to particular types of events? And what are some of the structures that need to change to avoid those stresses or improve our coping or capacity or our speed of recovery? What can we actually do? What are some of the deeper things that we can do? Is there some business structural change, restructuring? Is there some reorganisation that might help, um, you know, physical reorganisation of the place or financial or social reorganisation that might help? And then finally, you know, all of this is, is as I said, based on beliefs and we really um, need to ask ourselves and people around us, um, what, what are the big assumptions that we're making here? Um, how, how do we believe the, the system works? How do we believe it should work? How is it working? And does our, do our observations sort of fit with what we believe? What are our biases? So what are the things that um, are inbuilt and bias, biases in us that might be influencing the way we're seeing things and making decisions and therefore creating structures that give rise to these different patterns. What evidence are we using? So what are, the, what are we basing our beliefs on? So are we basing it on, you know, facts uh, or are we basing it on just assumptions? And it's easy, you know, for all of us to kind of um, flip and slip between those. And then finally about, you know, who has power to make change here? So often people sort of look to outside about change instead of actually saying, you know, it's, it's internal, oh, I'm the one that's got to make the change or, or we're the ones that have got to make the change and not expecting someone from outside to help make those changes. So we use this tool all the time and we have you know, discussions with people in groups about this all the time about where, where are we working here in the iceberg and are we being caught above the water here, just the tip of the iceberg where we're really focused on events instead of stepping back and asking these deeper questions. So Obviously, you know, I talked about the stress curve last week. If we're just dealing with events here, we're going to be subject to a lot of stress at the tip of the iceberg. Um, this is, you know, we said those stressful events are part of a pattern. So this can help us to think about that pattern and what's the, what's the nature of those different events and how do they relate to each other. And then finally, what's this deeper system that we're, you know, this is a particularly about how we think and organise and how it, um, we, work, we work at this deeper level. And of course, these influence each other. Our system, you know, gives rise to different types of stresses. If we're in, you know, live on a floodplain, we're more likely to get flooded if we than if we're living on, um, you know, not on a floodplain. So our system, our place, matters. It exposes us to particular, you know, it has a structure that exposes us to particular patterns uh, and events, and vice versa. So, and also um, thinking about this idea that at the tip of this iceberg. Um, really, if we're up here, we're often caught in just having to absorb and respond, absorb and respond in this kind of coping mode. And as I mentioned earlier, that stress is, is um, not something that we can sustain for a long period. If we're just constantly in this sort of event and cope, you know, um, and absorb and, and bounce back, we can't sustain that for very long as, as, as individuals or as families or as businesses. Eventually, your capacity is going to get um, exceeded, you're going to get worn down, something's going to give in the system. Down here um, is where the opportunities are for change. So, you know, it's looking at your system and seeing where are the opportunities. Is there a new market? Is there a way we can diversify? Is there a way we can, um, you know, some innovation that we can bring in, etc. So that's very much about how we think about the system. It's about what can we put in place to create new opportunities that will create those new structures that'll create new patterns, that'll lead to different events. We're never gonna get rid of events, but there'll be a different set of events and different types of events that we'll have to deal with in the future. These, this idea of working, you know, about coping and, and working around opportunities, creating opportunities, if you like, are sort of at the operational level, they're kind of at the action level. It still needs to be embedded in a broader resilience strategy and 
Um, so we use these terms on the left here to persist, adapt and transform as the sort of overarching strategy, if you like. So um, at the tip of the iceberg there, where you're just responding to events, you're really in that doing a lot of things that are about coping. So that might be just, um, you know, sometimes borrowing more money or, um, you know, at the personal level, it might be a coping thing, might be to, um, you know, try to do things, you know, hobbies or something like that that helps us relax. But that's really not changing the underlying kind of problems. And so we're going to get caught at the top of that iceberg a lot just to coping. And so there is times when we want to persist. We know that you have to persist. You've got to stick it out through things, but you can't do it long term. It's not that alone is not a resilience strategy. You need these other strategies in your kit bag, these higher level strategies of thinking about adapting to move away from particular things, you know, um, and to create new patterns. And you need to think about the ability to transform, which is to do things very differently. So you might, you know, move away fundamentally from um, one type of production system to another one. You might, um, you know, get rid of um, horticultural plantings and go into cropping or whatever it might be. That's a real transformation of the business. That's that deep structural change. And we need to have the capacity to do all of these three uh, and maintain that capacity. It's no good just being able to persist or even just to adapt. We also have to have the ability to think about and do transformation when it's needed. Otherwise, we're gonna get crunched at some point. That deeper change is really very strongly linked to beliefs, obviously. So it's how we see ourselves. It's about our identity as a, you know, do I see it myself as a, a, a beef farmer or do I see myself as just a farmer that might grow anything? Or do I see myself as actually, um, you know, changing roles altogether? And that's obviously deep, hard stuff for people because it's challenging your core identity. So it's very much linked to this idea of beliefs at the bottom. But that's where the real power for change comes from. And we need to at least explore that and develop our ability to have those thoughts and conversations um, at this, the bottom of this triangle. So that's a tool we use, the, the iceberg tool. And as I said, we'll send out a, a pro forma type that people can use. But a couple of key messages here. One is that, you know, events are the tip of the iceberg stresses and they sort of demand our attention, but they don't have a lot of power. The power for change actually sits deeper down. Um, and, you know, they can really lock us into this reactive recovery sort of mode or, you know, doing a lot of coping and what we'd call sort of broadly a persistence kind of mode. You're just there, you're just trying to stay the same and recover back to where you were. And as we know, that's just not enough. Real change mostly happens down below the waterline. So, and creating opportunities, you know, it happens down there. And so it's really about this high level strategy of adapting and transforming and having the ability to do that when you need to. So understanding that we can move from thinking about an event and reacting to an event to thinking about the patterns, to thinking about the structures, to the beliefs that can really help us to understand resilience and our own resilience, the resilience of our business and the resilience of our community or whatever it might be. Um, and focus about where's it, you know, where are we going to put our effort to try and strengthen resilience? So what's, what's our balance, if you like, between that sort of persistence effort at the top, um, the adaptive effort and that transforming kind of effort. The second little tool about diagnosing resilience that we use a lot and, and is a really powerful tool is this one called, it's called the adaptive cycle, but we just talk about this boom and bust in systems. So you'll see up the left hand side here, this idea of potential. And, and that's like, if you like, the potential of your system to create, you know, the things you want it to create. And along the bottom is connectedness. This is the linkages within the system. And uh, systems go through these cycles and, and we can recognise them in ourselves, we can see it in our business, we can see it in companies, we can see it in communities, uh, we can see it in big businesses around us. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of examples, an ecological example first to help us get our minds into this idea of this cycle, then a political example and then uh, another example after that to just show, I guess, that and help us to think about and recognise the fact that we do go through these kind of cycles personally. We go through them as a family or as a farm business together. 
and working out you know where we are and understanding where we are can help us think about what to do next so if we think at a, as an ecological take an ecological example think about a seedling that's growing um, and this might be after fire or it might be just a you know a seedling that starts to grow you think about as it grows it's got a lot of um, uh, space a lot of light and a lot of potential to, to start to do something else and it starts to grab resources and it starts to organize those resources and it puts them together and starts to create structures. So it creates these bigger emerging structures and there'll be a lot of competition um, when you're starting out. You know, as we all know, if you're starting a business or there's, um, you know, you've got a particular skill, there's gonna be other people out there that have got those skills. And so you might experience a lot of competition, but eventually you'll sort of uh, grow, you'll develop these bigger structures that gives you more capacity, you get more connected, you've got more potential gives you more ability to grab you know, resources and put them together, bring them um, together and use them in your business. And eventually you'll get to this sort of maturity phase or conservation phase, we call it sometimes, where the strategy goes from a kind of growth mindset to a, a more conservative mindset where you're really about keeping the system the same, you're about holding the system because you've done all the work to get it there, you've got it to something big uh, and you've got it producing the things you want it to produce we often then focus on trying to keep it like that. And the, the sort of irony here or the, the double-edged sword here is that actually at this most mature point where we've gone through all that growth is actually one of the most dangerous points, if you like, because it's when you become very brittle. So you don't have much flexibility uh, when you're in this phase. You've locked up, you've, you're very connected, you've connected everything, you've got your potential is very high, but you're very connected. An event, you know, in this case, a fire comes along, can create an enormous change, uh, and you suddenly have a, a huge release. All the connections are broken apart, the potential drops, and you know that event can be catastrophic. What that does, though, is creates opportunities, and it opens up new opportunities and windows for for thinking about new things. And so, in a forest example, at that maturity level, there's no new space. There's no space there for new species to come in. The, the, the system is locked, if you like, um, locked up. There's not a lot of place for innovation, for new ideas, for new species. Here though, once we've had that release, suddenly there is this incredible opportunity. The light, the water, the resources, the nutrients are all available to space. And so suddenly the system can, can um, go in different directions. It's got options available to it. Pretty soon, however, things will start to reorganise. And particularly if the old structures are still there, if those old structures still exist, things will get reorganised around those old structures and things will start to coalesce again, get organised again around particular things. And there's huge potential here for this to sort of take off again and go you know, on the cycle again and, and we'll see that you know, it takes off and we get into another growth phase and away it goes and goes up to that maturity phase. That cycle is well known in, in ecosystems. We can observe that in the way ecosystems grow and change and renew. But that cycle is also present in, in other systems, in social systems. Now, this is a political example. I didn't pick these guys for any particular political reason or point. I could have picked you know, another political party, I could have picked a company, but it's just I've always been interested in this change in, in these political systems. So people will remember after the, the election that John Howard lost, um, you know, he'd been the leader for a long time, incredibly stable uh, in terms of leadership, but it, it got to a stage where, you know, it became brittle, no new ideas, um, no change in leadership, all that kind of thing, no opportunity to renew. And so, um, you know, you get an election, you get a big release. It's the equivalent of the, the bushfire kind of release, if you like. And then you suddenly get a whole lot of innovation happens. And so, you know, people won't often remember this, but the, the Liberal Party at this time flirted with a, a couple of different, very different sort of leadership um, styles and philosophies. And, you know, the world would be, or our world, the, our nation would have gone on a different path because we had people um, with different sets of ideas um, and you know very different sort of um, approaches and philosophies of course though as I said if the structures still exist if those 
you know, some of those previous structures are still there, that will reorganise. And so that's when we saw, you know, leadership change and, and you get some new leadership coming in. Um, but that reorganisation wasn't sort of complete, if you like, and, and it wasn't bedded back down to go through another growth phase. We get another leadership change um, and, you know, ultimately we get another leadership change because the, the, the system hasn't really reorganised. And, you know, we could argue about where they, where they are now, the, the Liberal Party at the moment in terms of leadership and maybe they're in a big growth phase heading to maturity. Maybe they're still down in this... Um, uh, you know, corner. But the point is, um, organisations, families, farm businesses, companies go through cycles of change. And there's periods when you really are in a growth phase. And that's great. There's lots of innovation. It's very exciting. But then it'll reach a maturity phase. And when you do, that's a dangerous time because you start to become conservative. You start to say, we want to keep this going. We want to stay at this level. And we know that something is going to come along an event. And if the event is big enough and our capacity to cope is low or has been eroded, um, we will go through a big release phase and there'll be a big change is going to happen in that system. It might eventually reorganise and become a similar system. But the reality is it's going to go through what we call the back loop. There is going to be a period of um, disorganisation, reorganisation. The aim is to make that as painless as possible when there are these kind of big reorganisations, the big back loops, is how do we make sure we don't lose our too much potential? How do we make sure we don't lose too much connectedness? They're the things that are going to help us grow again. I put this up. Um, I always use this slide, this image, and I ask people if I'm doing a workshop, I ask people what it is. And most people talk about, they say it's heart rates, um, you know, breathing rates, those sort of things. Some people say it's stock market or financial things. It's actually the final ladder position of the Essendon Football Club. And I'm not an Essendon Bombers fan by any means, but I, it's just an interesting, um, I just grabbed this data and, and plotted it out. This is the final ladder position at the end of the season for the Essendon Football Club going back to the 18, uh, 1980s, sorry, the 1890s when uh, the football club first came into existence. So this has mapped it over the years up until 2006 or seven, I think it is at the end. Now, this pattern is boom and bust. And um, this sort of makes no sense. Like in theory, this is an organization with a single objective to win the most games of footy over the year that they can. And the aim is to finish higher on the ladder. So in theory, you should, see this kind of trending, you know, you should see um, some kind of average where the, the organisation is managing to stay at a fairly even level. It'll bounce up and down a bit in theory, but they should be, given they're aiming to, to win and the most games they can every year, that they should be staying, you know, sort of somewhere towards the top of this. But of course, the reality is very different. There's, there's also other teams in the system, so they're impacted by that, but also success is often followed by massive failure and that you know that it's hard to understand that pattern that how can it be that a team is complete you know successful one year and the next year it can have the worst year on record just about and if you look at some of these bouncing up and down it really is it goes from you know number one to, to last on the ladder just the following year and so there's some interesting underlying dynamics here it's not it's not a simple kind of um, dynamic but it but the message is you can't hold something constant, even for something like this with a single objective. Uh, you cannot hold it at one position and one level over time. Systems bounce up and down, and particularly when they're interacting with other parts of the system, like you know a footy club is, it will bounce up and down. Knowing that, that can help us prepare and think about the future. So. If we go back to our ideas here, obviously having coping capacity really helps here. If we can absorb one of those events, we might not you know, go through that big collapse, the big release phase. So having capacity here to cope and to cushion that blow, and even if we do go through that big release phase, having the capacity to, to um, absorb that impact and to reorganise will help get us back on the pathway. But of course, you know, if we were looking to change, 
this is the opportunity, this is where the opportunities are. There's opportunities here in this kind of collapse and the reorganisation phase to go in new directions. So think about post drought uh, in a farm business. It might be the window of opportunity now to say, okay, how are we going to reorganise this business? How are we going to reorganise the farm layout? How are we going to organise, you know, ourselves as a family or as a business to make sure that when we go through this loop again, uh, we're not just repeating the same pattern, that we're actually going to go through uh, and do something different so that we're going to end up in a different place, uh, not just coming back uh, around this loop again and again. Uh, and of course, you know, opportunities for growth is, that's where we get a big bang for our buck if we can come up with opportunities that create this new kind of growth phase. Uh, but good managers understand when they're reaching that maturity phase and they look for opportunities to avoid and, and sometimes deliberately give themselves a little release to go, you know, not through a big deep back loop, but through just a smaller kind of release that'll help them flip back onto that growth phase and go back up without going through a really big deep collapse and a reorganisation. That's, that's, you know, um, good management can do that. And we see it sometimes in companies, we see it sometimes in organisations that make decisions to get you know, big changes, get rid of a bunch of, um, you know, leaders from the, from the previous growth phase and, and bring in some new ones, et cetera. So it does happen. There's good examples of that in the, in the real world around us. So some key messages just about this little tool and this idea of the boom and bust cycle is that systems are never still. They evolve and they change over those cycles. Systems never kind of rest. They're always moving and they're always moving forward they never go backwards. They're always evolving and changing. They're never just at rest. Having the capacity to cope and create opportunities for change are important at different times during that boom and bust cycle. So we want to have those you know, capacities all the time, but they're, they're more important at different times. But we have to have, as we talked about with the iceberg, this bigger picture, the resilience strategy about persisting, adapting and transforming to really help us navigate these cycles. We don't want to be just going around and around in a persistence mode, boom and bust, crashing, getting back up, crashing again. We really want to be saying, okay, if that's the case, we need to adapt. We need to do something different. We need to try and uh, adapt or transform away so that we're not going through that cycle. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff I know and it's a lot of information, but hopefully you can just take some time, particularly if you can, um, uh, look at the, the, the slides, uh, we'll send that around as well as a PDF and, you know, um, watch through this video, through this link and, and um, maybe go back over it a couple of times. I'd really encourage you to think about um, how you can use this kind of thinking and just to ask yourself some questions or your family about, you know, the way, you know, our system's operating and we can use these tools to to really ask some questions about our, the resilience of our, our ourselves, our system. So um, we know that, you know, to address re resilience, we need the capacity to cope and create opportunities. We've got to be able to absorb and we've got to be able to bounce forward. The iceberg and, and the systems model can help us to think about when those different strategies matter, that, uh, those different actions matter, the coping and the opportunities but we have to take this bigger picture view of resilience. It, it, we've got to move beyond just coping and opportunity sort of level actions and think about the, the bigger picture, the deeper strategy for persisting, adapting and transforming in the face of change. And I'll leave it there, thank you. So I just want to deal with a couple of questions that came in uh, during the, the first presentation the, the, or, or comments. Well, the first comment was really around um, someone uh, from Terry about um, the cycle that Landcare goes through and, and particularly dri driven by the funding structures. And, and I totally agree, Terry, that the, essentially the structure, the way it's set up, short-term 
government funding, you know, three-year political cycles, three-year projects, means that Landcare can never really only be caught um, at the top of the loop, at the top of the iceberg and, and going through that, that loop. And we've seen that with groups. We can also think about the, the cycle of change, the boom and bust cycle for Landcare groups as well. So, you know, with stable funding and a stable, you know, having a coordinator and all of those things, we see Landcare, you know, grow and mature. Um, but then, uh, you know, funding changes, the key coordinator leaves, some key people leave and the, and the, the group will go through a, a big back loop. So I can see in Landcare, you know, evidence of both of these kind of tools. Um, it, is it deliberate? I'll, I'll leave it up to, to you to, um, to decide. But what I do know is it probably reflects a, a lack of understanding of, of the way, you know, communities uh, organisations, groups, people work and and, um, and we really need to think, you know, if we want to have land care operating in the long term, then we need to really think about how we, we change the structure. It won't change unless we change that structure because that the structure creates that pattern. That pattern creates those events that you mentioned, Terry. And, you know, all of that is, is underpinned by our beliefs of, of how we think the world should work. And at the moment, you know, um, we uh, as a society think that um, three-year funding cycles is is the way to go um, and that's probably largely driven by sort of government accountability type um, issues rather than the um, the real needs of of groups on the ground so I, I couldn't agree more um, the second comment was around people sort of experiencing you know, almost post-traumatic stress, if you like, um, down the track from an event and, and someone's just mentioned a, a person, you know, nine months after a bushfire sort of going through that collapse. And, I, you know, to be honest, I'm not really sure because um, there's no doubt we have these kind of patterns of thinking um, and the, the sort of cycles of thinking in our mind, if you like. They've gone through a big event. Um, so they they've experienced that kind of big crash, if you like. And what I would say is probably they haven't, the, the notion that, you know, they appeared all right in the intervening time is, is, is not, you know, not the case that in fact, people are processing stuff and then being triggered by going to a, a, a meeting or a discussion about the fire triggered all that, which says that really they weren't, you know, sort of out of, out of the back loop, if you like. Um, that would be my take, but, you know, obviously it's really complex. It's a, it's a difficult and sensitive area talking about mental health and, and the way that people cope. So, you know, again, I'll just stress the point that, that the most important thing is for people like that to get help and, to, and there's so much support and help available and, and, and people that can, um, you know, work with people to understand exactly what did happen and why that happened to, to that person. So, um, you know, so I can see sort of shadows, if you like, of these cycles in the way those sort of things play out for people psychologically. But I also wouldn't want to over kind of prescribe, you know, these cycles or the or the iceberg for that matter. They're just tools. They're thinking tools. They're heuristics. We call them to to help us to explore and to think about things. So I wouldn't want to try to too tightly, you know, um, prescribe. The, this kind of cycle or pattern to one particular event for an individual, but um, yeah, but it's very it's very interesting, and and I think seeing the way those events play out for people, it's different for everyone, and and that's one of the key messages I think we all have to learn is that people deal with these things in very different ways and in over different time frames, etc. And we just need to be very aware of that and very sensitive to that. So thanks for those questions. Well, that was excellent, and thanks for your answers to those questions from the audience. On behalf of the team, I would like to thank everyone for attending, and do not forget to provide your feedback and to register for the next webinar. Next week's book prize will be Alan Parker's The Negotiator's Toolkit. So to go in the running, please fill out the survey. The information it provides us is so important for us to run future events. We will send a follow-up email with all the relevant links and resources. See you for the third session on the 15th of October at the same time, 12pm. Bye.